everyone has been pretty nice to me and very welcoming, but the Mueller girls gave me copious numbers of drawings, so they're kind of winning right now, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you so much, choir. Um, it has been, it continues to be such an honor to be with you all this weekend. I want to thank Kristen, who's actually teaching communion right now, for planning and coordinating such uh, a full weekend, rich with discussion and questions and learning. Thank you to Paul, who is my mentor, my colleague and friend. Um, you are the reason I fell back in love with the church. And so I thank you to all of you for having me here this weekend. That being said, if anyone, and I mean anyone, had told me as a child that I would be preaching on World Communion Sunday at a historic Presbyterian church in Kansas City, I would have laughed in their faces. Why? Let's just start with the Kansas City part, okay? I may live in New York City right now, but I was born and raised in the Bay Area in Northern California. I had a very typical Korean American childhood. My father owned a dry cleaner and that I worked at during my summer breaks in middle school while my friends were at the pool or playing sports. My mother is a retired pathologist and had two acceptable career tracks for me, for me and my sisters, medicine and law which leads to the ridiculousness of the notion that I would one day become a full-time, I actually do this for a living and not just for fun on Sundays, pastor slash preacher. I remember when I was in college and I told my parents that I wanted to pursue full-time ministry. Mind you, they are both extremely dedicated Christians. In fact, the moment that I told them, we were even in the midst of our very own time of family Bible study and prayer. I know, pretty hardcore, right? In my mind, the setting was perfect. Everyone was overflowing with the love of God, filled with the Holy Spirit. Surely my parents would be elated that their youngest daughter wanted to dedicate her professional life to the Lord. Imbued with irrational confidence, I just came right out and said, Mom, Dad, after graduation, I want to go to seminary and go into full-time ministry. Complete Silence. And I mean complete silence for what seemed like an eternity. Finally, my mom spoke up and said, okay, well, you can still go to law school at night. <laughs> I didn't. I just went to seminary. But as a parent myself, I now get where they are coming from or where they were coming from. As immigrants, they wanted nothing more than for their daughters to have security and success, and those were the options presented to them as a way to ensure that bright future. Because to be fair, those were the options that were presented to me as well, and not just by my parents. As far as I could tell, Asian girls grew up to be Asian women, and Asian women were typically not pastors, especially in historical mainline traditions like the Presbyterian Church. Now, you might have noticed that when I told my parents I wanted to go to seminary, I said that I wanted to go into full-time ministry. Being an ordained pastor wasn't even on the table. But if there's one thing that my parents taught me, it's that if you are going to do something, do it with all you've got, with your heart, your soul, your mind, and as you all have been talking about for the past few weeks, your body. But I have to say that the body part was the hardest one for me to come to terms with. As many of you learned this, this past weekend, I grew up in the evangelical church where I was told that because my body is female, God did not want me to be a pastor. And even when I went to seminary in the predominantly Caucasian mainline church, I got the sense that because my body was Asian, the church did not want me to be a pastor either. But my parents knew better and God knew better. Actually, thanks to all of you, I am the first woman of color to serve as a pastor at one of the tall steeple Presbyterian churches in New York City. Now, you might be thinking, what did we have to do with all of that? Well, you hired that guy, and I took his job when he left. <laughs> So the reality is, without all of you, I wouldn't be employed, so thank you. 
In all seriousness, this is a really long-winded way of saying that this is a big deal for me to be with you all today on this World Communion Sunday as your guest preacher, as your Hague lecturer, your sister in Christ, your fellow laborer in the field. And guess what? The field is changing. Yes, there are things that are wilting, maybe even dying, but there is also growth and life abundant life. And I'm here to say that we, my friends, are in the midst of a season of hope and renewal. As Sikh civil rights activist Valerie Kaur once said, maybe this isn't the tomb. Maybe it's the womb. May it be so. Will you pray with me? Lord, open our hearts and our minds that as your scripture is read and your word is proclaimed, we might hear with joy deep, abiding joy, what you have to say to us today, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This morning's scripture reading comes to you today from the gospel according to John. Friends, listen hard and listen good to God's word as it comes to you this morning. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the lake saw that there had been only one boat there. They also saw that Jesus had not got into the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Friends, the word of the Lord. So if you haven't picked up on this by now, my mom is kind of a rock star. Loving wife and a mother of three, clinical pathologist, my mother to me is the embodiment of courage and grace. She immigrated to the US for medical school when she was 35, and get this, she learned English while doing her residency at Cedar sinai in Cleveland. And this past summer, she is going to kill me for saying this out loud, my mom turned 70. In the Korean culture, the 70th birthday celebration, known as Hwangap, is a big deal. There's lots of partying and feasting, and the children of the birthday celebrant are called to offer their gifts and respect. 
modernizing this tradition, my sisters and I planned a weekend getaway with my mom, full of fun and frivolity. We went out to dinner, we sat by the pool, we got spa treatments, and we went to a magic show. After hearing rave reviews, my sister got us all tickets to this one-man off-Broadway show entitled In and of Itself, created by and starring magician and storyteller Derek Delgadio. Now, there is a 30-minute version of this story, but since we are Presbyterian and it is World Communion Sunday, you are just going to have to settle for the five-minute version. You are devastated, I know. <laughs> now, i got to be honest. I wasn't expect expecting much when I got to the theater other than your run-of-the-mill, sit in your seat, watch a show, clap, and then leave type of experience. But from the moment we walked into the building, it was different. <coughs> Upon entering the theater, we were immediately confronted with a wall of cards, all starting with the words, I am. Hundreds of identities in alphabetical order, ranging from the ridiculous, like I am a ninja, to the functional, like I am a vegan, to the vulnerable, like I am a failure. We weren't given any specific direction other than to pick a card, any card. The result of this lack of supervision was that some people took the activity very seriously, pouring over each card, pulling one only to put it back in favor of another. Others just grabbed the first card that caught their eye. Now, once we had our cards, we were instructed to tear it in half and give the identifying portion to the docent before taking our seats. In no particular order, we walked into the theater and gave up the part of our identity that said ninja or vegan or failure. All we were left with was a card that said, I am. The theater only held about 100 people, and by the end of the show, I'm certain that we all felt like we had gotten our money's worth of magic and entertainment. There were sleight-of-hand sleight of card tricks, astounding illusions, and powerful, riveting storytelling. But one trick remained. The magician returned to the cards we had all selected prior to the show. He acknowledged the fact that some people chose their cards haphazardly. But for those who chose seriously, he invited to stand. And for his final trick, the magician said he would tell each and every one of us which card we chose. And if he was correct, we were to sit down. Out of the 100 people in the room, I would say at least 75 people stood up. And one by one, the magician made a pronouncement on the individual standing, and one by one, the person in the spotlight sat down, stunned and speechless. Some of the identities he confirmed were aspirational. He said, you are a world changer. Some were honest. You are an introvert. I'm sorry I made you stand up, he would say. <laughs> And some were heartbreaking, but in those cases, the magician would disagree. No, my friend, you are not a failure. As to be expected in a room full of New Yorkers, the reactions were varied. Some were cynical, skeptical, unimpressible. There were those who were utterly unwilling to enjoy the experience and instead furiously scanned the room for hints as to how the trick was done. A hidden camera, perhaps, a well-placed earpiece. But there were some who didn't care as much about how the trick was done as much as what the magic was doing to all of us. A perfect stranger in a room full of strangers telling us the most intimate thing about ourselves that we most feared, we most hoped for, we most believed to be true. It was intense. And in looking back, I imagine that must have been how Zacchaeus felt when Jesus called to him in that tree or what the woman at the well felt when Jesus saw her and spoke to her, to be seen so fully, to be known so completely by someone you had never even met. Now, I'm not some crazy fan of magic or anything, but that night I realized that the power of magic lies in its ability to challenge our understanding of how we think things work, how reality works. It transforms the mundane and ordinary aspects of our lives. It forces us to experience moments of wonder and awe. And it reminds us that maybe, just maybe, 
there is more than meets the eye. After all, just because it's magic doesn't mean it isn't real. Now, let's be clear. The fact that the magician knew my card, now that's just a trick. But the fact that he knew me, that was magic. A magic that I desperately needed, a magic that I was hungry for. And apparently, I'm not the only one. This past August, the Pew Research Center released its most recent study entitled, Why Americans Go and Don't Go to Religious Services. Not surprisingly, the number one reason Americans go to religious services like church is to become closer to God, to encounter the divine, to experience some magic. On the flip side, one would think that the number one reason people do not go to religious services is that they don't believe in God, right? That was actually the number two reason. The number one reason why Americans do not go to religious services is because they are practicing their faith in other ways. Now, if I were to read between the lines on these important findings as a professional churchgoer of sorts, my conclusion would be that people, by and large, want to be close to God, want to encounter God, want to experience God. But unfortunately, that's just not happening in places like the church anymore. Now, why is that the case? Well, we could easily point to a number of factors as to why the church has become one of the least holy of places in society, from the politicization of, well, everything, to cultural and generational changes. But my guess is much more elementary than that. I think one of the reasons that we've stopped going to church, believing in church, encountering God in the church, is because the magic is gone. We are no longer willing to wrestle with the unexplainable and the indescribable. Instead, we have settled for that which we completely understand, that which we completely control. We've gone full tilt from the romantic to the rational, the inspired to the intellectual, the sacred to the secular. And in doing so, we have kept the world of magic and mundane so far apart that never shall the two meet. Now, here's the irony. As the Pew study shows us, we don't actually want it this way. I would even go as far as saying that the church won't survive if things stay this way. It's not what we were destined to do in the house of God, who we were destined to be as children of God. It's all right there in our passage for the morning. In John 6, we encounter Jesus after he has just performed some pretty impressive magic of his own. Lest we forget, our Messiah was also a magician of sorts. From feeding a crowd of 5,000 to walking on water, Jesus was all about upending our understanding of reality and truth, never letting us think we have it all figured out. So after performing, some of his own, after performing his own disappearing act of sorts, Jesus finally reveals himself to a persistent crowd who immediately starts interrogating him about his whereabouts. They want to know how the trick is done. Not taking the bait, Jesus responds by saying, you guys are just looking for me because I gave you some bread. Now let's be clear. When I fed you that one time, that was just a trick. But when I give you food that lasts for an eternity, now that is magic. True to their identity as the crowd, the masses completely miss what Jesus is trying to say. And instead, they lean into that which they understand, that which they can explain. How do we get this bread? Where is it from? What's the catch? I actually love these moments in Scripture. A litany of stupid questions followed by sacred silence. (laughs) The calm before the storm where Jesus unleashes gospel truth in the only way he knows how. The unwitting protagonist asks her seemingly logical questions, setting Jesus up so perfectly you would think he orchestrated the entire exchange just so he could say what came next, just so he could show the crowd what C.S. Lewis calls the deep magic a magic that we will never fully be able to understand or explain, but a magic that resonates deep within our hearts and our souls. It is the deep magic of our faith. 
And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me, I will never drive away. And this is the will of him who sent me, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Friends, I know sometimes it is hard to believe, but there's still magic in this place. Deep, deep magic. There's magic in what we do here as a church, as a community of faith, as a people of God. There is magic in what we say, in what we hear, and what we do. There's even magic in these beautiful and broken bodies of ours, the colors they carry, the scars they bear, the stories they tell. And while at times we may have forgotten that this magic exists, it doesn't mean it isn't real. Because the magic we are swimming in is an ancient, sacred magic that, that has the power to bring us closer to God and the power to transform our ordinary lives. The question is, are we willing to participate in that magic? Are we willing to acknowledge that there's something powerful at work that we can't always touch or see, yet we know is there? Are we willing to suspend our constant need for undeniable proof and adequate explanations and for mere moments just accept the presence of the divine in this ordinary place? Or have we forgotten that the greatest magic ever done was not performed in some big theater by some stage magician, but took place right here in our broken and hurting world? when the creator of the universe, the God of humanity, was transformed for our sake before our very eyes into one of us. It doesn't get much deeper than that. Now, for those of you who still aren't convinced, I just have one final trick for you this morning. In a few earthly minutes, we are going to partake in the sacrament of communion. Now, I know some of you have observed this ritual countless times, while for others of you, it might be your first time. Regardless, what we are actually doing in the act of communion bears repeating. Now, on the outside, it seems like we are just breaking a loaf of store-bought bread and pouring some Welch's grape juice into a fancy cup. But I assure you, it is much more than that. Because when we break that bread, we are going to utter the preposterous phrase, this is Jesus' body broken for you. And when we pour that cup, we are going to proclaim the ridiculous notion, this is Jesus' blood shed for you. Now, just because we are Presbyterians and we don't necessarily believe that these elements transform into the actual body and blood of Christ, it doesn't mean that this moment is any less sacred, any less enchanted. Because if we truly believe in the deep magic of our faith, then we also believe that a transformation will indeed take place within us, within our hearts, our souls, our minds, and God willing, even within our bodies. So if you look hard enough, if you shelve your cynicism long enough, and if you hold God and each other close enough, you will watch as this 100-year-old sanctuary transforms into a great big table where all are welcome and everyone has a seat. Right before your very eyes, strangers will become family, the bread and the cup will become grace and truth, and your earthly body will become God's very presence here on earth. Your hands will be God's hands helping those in need. Your feet will be God's feet going into those places where no one else will go. And your face will be God's face to everyone you meet. Because the magic of our faith, the magic of our Lord is real. And the good news of the gospel is that we get to participate in that holy reality today, tomorrow, and forevermore. In a minute, the choir will sing the hymn, Jesus, We Are Here. 
At that time, I invite those of you who brought food for the feast to come forward and bring it to any of these tables that are here at the front. For the rest of you, allow yourself, and I mean really allow yourself, to witness the transformation taking place in this space, in each other, and in yourself. Friends, let's prepare our hearts to receive God's grace. 